And now I'd like to welcome one of the inimitable voices of CBC's As It Happens for almost a decade. Please welcome Mary Lou Finley. You're so composed, Yvonne. Oh, I should turn on my mic. Is that what you're saying? No, I don't need to yet. Okay. <laughs> I don't need it now. Um, it gives me huge pleasure to be here tonight. I am a big fan of the library, as some of you know, as Yvonne knows. Um, I've been here as a guest listening to some wonderful speakers, including uh, the author that we're about to hear from again tonight. And so this is a real treat for me. Um, to introduce somebody that you probably haven't heard of. <laughs> Louise Penny is the best-selling author, for those two or three of you in the room who may not have started the series yet, of the Inspector Gamache series, set in Three Pines, a small village, so tiny it's not even on the map, south of Montreal, near the US border. Uh, the characters that she has created were an instant success. They moved into people's lives immediately, as your presence here tonight attests to, and also the avalanche of awards that the very first book was met with. Uh, I think uh, at least eight, but all the biggies, the, uh, uh, Louise has won every major mystery award and many others, and remains now at the best, on the top of the bestseller list every time a new book comes out. Um, I've had the pleasure of having a peek at the book, and I know that you're not going to be disappointed by this number 10 in the series, The Long Way Home. And I don't think I need to take up any more of your time. I'd like to introduce, to ask Louise to join me up here on the deck. even start talking about the book, I want to congratulate you. It's been quite a year for you, the Order of Canada, oh, to start the with. Canada. Here. This is the Order of Canada pin. I wear it proudly. I'm very, very, very proud of it. When that. was the actual uh, investiture? Well, it hasn't happened yet. Oh, okay. <laughs> but they give you the pin anyway. So I, I made this out of toilet paper. <laughs> <laughs> You're all invited. They actually, they send it to you. Um, and then they say, We're, we'll invite you to a ceremony anon, anon. sometime. <laughs> I'm still waiting. I'm afraid they've changed their minds, but it's too late. <laughs> and an honorary doctor of laws. Yes. Is that the first one? That, the first one. <laughs> I'll bet Yes, it's the first okay. one. Okay, oh, there will yes. be more. From Bishop's University? From, from Bishop's University, which was very, it's in Lennoxville which was very moving for me, because it's, it's a, very close to where I live, and it also happens to be the university my father went to after the war. Um, so that was, it, that was extremely moving for me to be up there, and, and, and to know that he had to actually go there, and I got it in 10 minutes. Was... <laughs> yeah, it had nothing to do with 45 years of work. <laughs> what, what did you say in your speech? In the speech, well, you know, it was difficult to know what to say. Um, because uh, you, you, they, were, they were very clear, 10 minutes, which was perfect. You know, they don't want anyone to go on for too long for these poor students, because it's their day, not mine, or at least they think it's their day, but it's... <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to harangue them by, you know, all the wisdom I've learned. Um, but they want a little wisdom. But they wanted a little wisdom, which was also a bit of a problem, because I had to sit down and think, all right, oh, gosh, what have I learned? Um, so you know what I talked about? I decided, you know, instead of, I've learned so much more from um, mistakes I've made or bad things that have happened to me. I've learned more about myself. You and I, oddly enough, in the green room back there, we were talking about Gary Larson. Yeah. One yeah. of my favorite cartoons of all time, and I, I, I got a, a t-shirt actually with this cartoon, I gave it to Michael, my husband, who's a scientist. 
And it, it, it's a Gary Larson Far Side cartoon that shows two scientists, and they're at a blackboard, and there's a whole bunch of formula on one side, and then there's a gap, and on the other side is the solution. And in the gap is written, and then a miracle occurs. <laughs> <laughs> and I was thinking, it's fantastic. <laughs> and the one scientist is saying to the other, I think you have to be a little more specific. <laughs> and that's when people, when I go on book tour, and people say, well, how did you get published? Although, to be honest, it's really more like, how did you get published? <laughs> but I choose to hear, how did you get published? Um, and I, I will tell them about this farce. You know, you work, you work, you work, and then a miracle occurs. <laughs> and then you get published. But I talked in this, I talked about the gap, and the fact is there, there was a gap that allowed the miracle to occur, and the, and the gap was um, that I became an alcoholic um, through all sorts of things, and I won't get into it right now. Working at the CBC has that. That effect. may have helped. <laughs> <laughs> We're just trying to wean her off right now. <laughs> this, is, this is actually the intervention. They let me you. out. These are your friends, your family, we care about you. <laughs> um, and, and came to the edge and, and looked into the abyss and had to make a, a, a choice in life. And I did, so I talked to the, the, the students about the abyss and, and what it's like and that I hope to God they never meet the abyss, but if they do, that they, please, dear God, don't take it as the end of the, the world. It isn't. Just ask for help and know that sometimes the miracle occurs. And on the other end, you know, honestly, no gap, no miracle, no miracle, no books, no books, no Dr. Penny. So it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and you saw it all clearly, right? God the bless start. the gap. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the gap. Your gap year was very productive. <laughs> um, still, it was, it was a great turning point in your life, and it, we're really happy that you took it. Thank you. The last book, um, you, you, do you worry every time that the oh. next book isn't going to be any good? Because they've all been really good. Well, I, I wasn't worried until Did now. Did you ever throw any? <laughs> it's good. It's really good. <laughs> did you ever throw any out? Have you ever tossed one out? I did. I, I tossed the first draft of the second book out. Okay. Second book was terrifying. I'm sure you've heard this before I've heard before from, from authors. other authors, yes, because the first one was a huge success. The, the first one was a success. Yeah. The first one also took me 45 years to write. <laughs> and then my agent, God bless her, got a publishing contract, and she said, and the next book is due in 12 months. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. So I was, I was terrified. And so I, I wrote, for some people I think fear is um, a, a catalyst. For me, it's not. Fear petrifies me. Mm. I mean, it sounds silly, of course, petrifies. But it really does. It freezes me. And, and very little good comes out of my life when I am afraid. Uh, and so I, I wrote this first draft in a, in a, in a state of, of great terror because I was being handed everything I've ever wanted, a publishing contract. First book was coming out. It hadn't actually come out yet, but it was, you know, the, the buzz was good. Mm -hmm. And all I really, I had, to, I had to write a second book, and it had to be at least as good as the first. And I didn't know how I'd written the first book. There, it, it seemed magical to me. So I couldn't recreate it. I didn't know how to do it. Um, so I, I wrote and I wrote and I wrote, but it wasn't good. And it was just, yeah, that was dreadful. It was, it was the a same terrible people? feeling. Same people, same Gamache, people. Three Pines, the whole thing. Right. But I, I realized I was writing to try to please rather than writing the book that should really be written for the characters and their development. Um, so I, I got to the stage where I just knew it was off, and then I went to a therapist. I'm a big fan of, of asking for help. Mm. Um, so I went to a therapist. I didn't want to suffer from writer's block, as I had at one stage. And um, I told her what the problem was, and she, she said, well, clearly the wrong person is writing the book. And it's not very helpful. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not writing the check, if that's going to be your <laughs> advice. <laughs> And so I asked her, what do you mean? And she said, well, your critic is writing the book. I said, you're, what you have to do is you have to thank your critic, you have to bless your critic, but you have to show the critic the door. Don't lock the door, because you're going to need her later. <laughs> but your creative 
spirit needs to write the first draft. And just write and give yourself permission to be wrong. Give yourself permission to make mistakes. Give yourself permission to write a flawed first draft, even a terribly flawed first draft. If you want to write 10 pages on a pitcher of water, do it. It's not going to end up in the final draft. You know that. Just write, and write from a position of joy and gratitude and awareness of how lucky you are that you get to do this. And, and find that again. And, and I could just feel the tension lift and the, the, the lashes come off of my back. And I went back. I threw away the entire first draft. Did you change the story? Or was it a, a, a little bit. But the, but the outline was the, still there. You just that's wanted... right. But I had started from the wrong place, and it just, it just wasn't gelling. The characters weren't coming together. I threw away the whole first draft, even though the deadline was fast approaching. But I knew it just wasn't right. It wasn't right for the characters. It wasn't a book I would be proud of. I threw it away, started again, and, and moved forward. And that second book, which was so painful to write, um, ended up winning the Agatha was Award. Was even more awards. Yes, <laughs> which was amazing. But in this process, though, my, my agent phoned up. Now, she's, she lives in the UK, in Britain, so she, she's got, obviously, a British accent, as some of you might have. But, so I want you to forgive what I'm about to say, but I, and I know it's my own, just my own colonial ears. But every time I hear someone speak in that kind of an accent, there is... What I hear is an implied, you idiot. <laughs> She's the headmistress. <laughs> yes, she is. She's the headmistress, exactly. And I always imagine her with a big cigar and a vat of martinis, and she's brushing ash off her bazoom. She calls up. So she called me up in the middle of writing this crappy first draft of book two, and she said, so Louise, how's it going? I said, oh, Teresa, I'm afraid. I'm afraid. And she said, oh, for God's sake, it's not war and peace you're writing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, right. It's the frying pan in the face. <laughs> Doing. Then she called back when she sobered up the next day. <laughs> and, and she said, okay, now here's the thing. She said, the thing is, most writers write 1,000 words a day. Most crime fiction is 90 to 100,000 words. Ergo, it should take you, you know, 100 days to write the book. <laughs> then she hung up again. Now, <laughs> this was a great gift for me because up, as I, up until this point, as I said, yeah. I had thought that there was something magic. Right. And I realized there is actually a structure. A discipline. At the same time, I read Terry Fox's memoirs that Douglas Couplin yes. edited and, and came out with a book, beautiful little book. He's my hero. Douglas Terry, Terry, Terry Fox. Fox. Oh, I, I worked in Thunder Bay, and I arrived there about a month after he had stopped his, his run, and they have obviously a, a, a marker there. It was a beautiful, beautiful book, and this was done with Terry Fox's, his, Betty, his mother's approval and their collaboration. Um, but in the book, Terry Fox talks about how he, how he did it. And nobody was more aware than Terry Fox of what the goal was, to run from one end of the country to the other. But he said every day he woke up, and he got outside, and he ran, and he ran. He wasn't running to Victoria. He Ooh. was running to the next corner. Ooh. And he ran to the next corner, and he ran to the next corner. And he knew if he did that often enough, he would get to where he needed to go. So that dovetailed with what my agent said, of just run to the next corner. So every day I wake up now, I'm, I'm working on the next book, and I don't, I don't write to the end, because it would, it would overwhelm me. I, I run to the next corner. I write the best thousand words I can that day with joy. And then I start again the next day, and I start again the next day. I'm so relieved to hear you say you're working on the next book. I was going to ask you, <laughs> because there are many w senses in which, you, you know, that became a question. <laughs> there, there were 10 books, and Gamash is retired, and you think, oh, no, she's not going to stop. <laughs> next thing you know, she'll be killing him off or something. <laughs> anyway. Oh, he gets kidnapped by aliens <laughs> in the next one. <laughs> when did you finish this? I finished that about a year ago. 
that long? Huh? Yeah, well, it's not quite a, a year ago. I think it was probably December or so. Well, I, so I you probably don't it. remember anything about it, but <laughs> <laughs> which is fine because we can't tell anybody anything about it either. Anyway, can no, we? Well, we can't it's difficult. Tell them too much in a mystery. No, no. Um, well, that's the thing, and especially with the mysteries being so intertwined yeah. now, it's very difficult. I really don't want to say too much. Except that. Except the alien kid. What's? But that's the next one. <laughs> In the, in the Peter doesn't come back. That's this right. Is, I mean, this, what, this what we are telling starts. you is that where there's a certain presumption that, that you've read a certain, and even if you haven't, we're not letting, you know, we're not telling you who, who did any murders. But in the character development, Clara and Peter, who are a couple at one stage, a few books back, Clara kicks him out finally. And um, with the understanding that in a year, he will come back, they'll have no contact in that time, he'll come back, they will have a, a dinner together, they will decide where they are in their relationship. Well, she waits for him and he never comes back. And there's no word, no, no phone call, nothing. So of course she's hurt and then she's angry and then she's worried. So eventually she goes to Gamash and asks, and this all happens early, you know, in yeah. the first chapter, so ask for his help. Now Gamash has found a piece that he didn't, he, he's never experienced before in Three Pines, and he's in no big rush to, to jump into another case. He just, he's trying to heal, he's trying to figure things out for himself. Um, but of course, he loves Clara, and he, he, he loves the people there, he owes them, and so he agrees. And that's really the catalyst to, that sets them off on this journey. Now, and this play, we can also talk too about setting, because location is so important mm -hmm. in your books. The psychology, um, the relationships between people and the setting. Three Pines, of course, where everybody wants to live. And again, you take them outside mm -hmm. and you go to the wild north shore of the St. Lawrence. Yes. Where you have, have you ever been there? I, I know. I've been, in, I know. I've been up down the south shore, but uh. not the north shore. And it sounds quite amazing. Has anyone here been to the lower north shore of Quebec? Have you? Yes, to where to? Have. A few have. Can you remember any of the villages? There was Tadoussac. This is beyond Tadoussac, and it's beyond. That's the sort of the, the Charlevoix. Yes, and I write about the Charlevoix, and then what? Well, you know, this I feel like a child in a candy shop because how wonderful to have these locations to talk about. Did Did you go there and then decide to write, or did you decide that that was going to be your next place and then go and research? That's right. Well, I. I I decided it would be the next place, because I sat down and thought, I knew it was going to be a journey. I, I wanted, I knew Peter wouldn't come back, I knew that they had to go out and try to find him, but then I had the whole world. I mean, they could presumably go to, to Scotland. Tibet, <laughs> yes. So they could go anywhere, they could go anywhere in Quebec. Um, so I decided it would be in Quebec, but where in Quebec? And Charlevoix is such a magical place. It is in, in every way. Um, just st staggeringly beautiful. It's, it's up the river from, or is it down river? I'm never down sure. Down the river. Down river, down thank you. Down towards the ocean. That's right. Down river uh. from Quebec City. And then further down river, right by the very end, is um, a place called the Lower North Shore. And when Cartier was, came by for the first time and he was mapping it, it was so desolate that he called it the land God gave to Cain. Isn't that perfect? And I, I managed to travel there a few times when I worked for CBC in, Thun, in uh, Quebec City. And uh, it's, oh, it's so beautiful, but it really is desolate and almost nothing grows because it's all stone and rock and, uh, and the people there are extraordinary. So I really wanted to talk about that. So I, I knew that that's where they were going to go. So that was, that was a joy to write about, it was a joy to research. It was. So about half the there. book is set in Three Pines, and then, then four of them take off on this, this journey to try to, to find Peter, uh, you know, who's lost. But it's really about also finding themselves, finding their own lost souls, and finding a lost soul who's clearly, oh my god. <laughs> Do you have to take that? Excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> Is it the restaurant? <laughs> it's my agent. <laughs> so it, it never rang, 
please. <laughs> oh, oh, that reminds me. Don't let me forget to take a photograph of you lovely people, okay, before, before this is over. Because I want to send it to my publisher to prove that I showed up. <laughs> <laughs> that suggests that you don't sometimes. Well, yeah. which, which is not surprising. Let, <laughs> let, no, no, let me, just, let me just give people a sense of what your next 10 days will be like. Tomorrow, New York City. The day after, Pittsburgh, North Carolina. Ann Arbor, Michigan, the next day. Each place is another day. Omaha, Nebraska, Minneapolis, Seattle, Phoenix, Houston, and Vancouver. Yes. A different yes. place every day. Someone with not a great sense of geography. That's true, too. <laughs> Seattle, Texas, Vancouver. <laughs> so what? How do you pack for that? <laughs> well, I got smart a couple of tours back. I realized how, how, what freedom there is with a, with a carry-on. So I shove everything. Now I have to say, which means that I basically wear much the same thing all the time. So by Vancouver, you know, there's like this cordon <laughs> around me. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's a different audience. It's a different time. audience. You guys are lucky. You, you can come close. She's fresh right now. Yeah, I'm fresh. <laughs> so what is it with North Carolina? <gasps> I love North Carolina. But do you have a special connection there? Because Not at all. There are always, always rave reviews in the Richmond Times mm -hmm. and the Charlottesville. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's on the tour, I noticed. I mean, they're crazy about you. Well, do you know, I was there last year for the first time it's, uh, to this particularly, particular village. It was so pretty yeah. that I said, I want to return. <laughs> so, so they're sending me back there. My publisher. Um, Andrew Martin is actually coming down too, and he's going to be doing what you're doing. He's going to be Mary Lou Finley. Oh, lucky him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I thought you might have some family connection or something. No, no, I don't. No, it's, it's been really um, wonderful to me to see how the Americans have embraced the books and, and embraced Canada then and, and Quebec and, and a real curiosity. And it was important to me that, that the books be set unmistakably in Canada, and, and, and unmistakably too within Canada, within Quebec, that there be such a keen sense of place. Because I'm very proud of, I'm proud of being a, a, a Canadian. I'm, I'm deeply proud of being a, a Canadian, and I want there to be absolutely no doubt about it. Do you think it's lucky that you, you chose Quebec, though, instead of Toronto? I mean, it's a more exotic. <laughs> <laughs> No. Well, Toronto's their hometown, yeah, but it's it is. not so exotic, perhaps. It wasn't, to... certainly wasn't planned. It was done because I, I live Lived in Quebec, there. and it really is a bit of a love letter to a place where I found um, a sense of home and belonging. Um, but it turned out to be quite lucky, of yeah. course, because it is exotic. The, I think most, American, most people in the world understand that there is French, but I, I think they're kind of vague beyond that, and, and that I could make it clear that the French fact in Quebec isn't um, a whim and it's not marginalized. Yeah. It is very present. You have become, through this meteoric. When that is the, true. When was the first? When was the first? <laughs> First book published? Ten years ago. I mean, we're celebrating 10 years, ten years of our manga magazine. One a year. <laughs> so happy. A meteor, uh, I, I was going to say rise, but in fact, you were a success right from the start. But now you're in industry. Yeah. You have a guided tour going on in Quebec City of, you know, from uh, Bury Your Dead. You have Hovey Manor has special hotel oh. visits for people. Hovey Manor. You have a, a virtual book club. I, it's amazing that you find time to write, because do you have to sort of keep an eye I don't, on I haven't things? actually written a book in many years now. You it's, now have someone else write the book. Yes, my therapist is yes. writing it. She sounds like she knows what she's doing. <laughs> <laughs> do you know these things that, you, and thank you for mentioning them, the, the, the Barrier Dead tour, for instance, in Quebec City, I, I, I have nothing to do with that. Well, they, they were very nice. They came to me and they said, would you mind? Yeah. And I said, I, you know, sort of theoretically, no, but I'm very protective of the characters and of very course. protective of the books. And, and I don't want you to go to Quebec City and put down $30 and end up with something second rate. 
So I said, yes, but I'll come to Quebec City, we'll sit down, we'll talk, we'll go over the route. I want to make sure that, yeah. that they understood it the takes books. Time. That's right, and yeah. that they really, it came from a place of, of industry, of course, they want to make money. I'm very, you know, I, I think that's fantastic, but also from a place of respect for the books and the characters, yeah. and sure, you know, and I hear that it's fantastic, so I, I gave them the seal of approval, and the same with Javi, but I don't, I honestly, I don't, I don't get anything out of it except, you know, the pleasure. And is there a TV series in the works? Uh, no, not? no, there was a, a one, a film was made of Still Life, the but that was off. all, right. Okay, so you don't, you haven't heard whether there No, I'm not in any big rush to, no. uh, to repeat the, you know, it's, it's, just, it's just difficult, that's all. It's just, it's a painful, and I don't think you'll find very many authors who don't feel the same way. The, um, they don't necessarily see the characters the way you do. They have to change the story. And it is, obviously, it's a different medium, yeah, so it's, it's medium. not, it, it needs to be yeah. their film, and it's my book, and I, it's just very difficult for me to, to separate from the two. You know, it's funny, I've talked to people about what they see because when a beloved character comes on the screen, many people will say, oh, it's not how I pictured them at all. Other people will say, oh, it's exactly how I pictured them. But when we get right down to it, we find that we don't have a very specific image mm. of the person. We have a sense of mm. what they look like, but it's not exact. We can't describe them, so there's some leeway there. I think that's perfect. I love that. I love it when people, it, it becomes yeah. obviously your own character, and you have a, se yeah. a, a, a sense of intimacy with them, and stop seeing them in many ways as characters. I mean, I, I feel, I, I mean, it doesn't come as a surprise to me that our manga match doesn't exist. I understand that, but. <laughs> <laughs> you sure? <laughs> <laughs> but I, I'm. I, I, they do feel very alive to me, and I have a sense of that I owe them something because they've given me a life beyond anything I, I ha ever had the right to imagine I would have. You said uh, in, in one of your newsletters, I think, that um, Gamache, or perhaps the hair, was inspired by a tailor <laughs> in, uh, well, whose name was Jean Gamache? Yes! The name. This woman is a isn't no, she You're fantastic. Remember something for 24 hours. I just read it. <laughs> <laughs> Did you find that when you were doing the, the, the CBC stuff? You like retain, like you have six things, six compartments in your head and something new comes in and something I was like goes. that from the time I crammed for exams in school. Oh. I do it the night before because right. my memory is short term. <laughs> right, right. And by noon it's gone. One, yeah. one good sneeze it's, and it's, it's gone. there goes <laughs> geometry. That's right. But Gamash, you have said here before, is also a lot about him was inspired by Michael. Yes. The man who was, you have just celebrated your 18th wedding anniversary, God. I think. This is frightening. Um, yes. yes. Yeah, we just celebrated our, our 18th wedding anniversary, and in October, it'll be 20 years from our first date. Okay. <laughs> But it's a bittersweet occasion. Isn't yeah, it? yeah, it is because he's recently been diagnosed with dementia. Um, so yeah, that. But you know, the funny thing is, as anyone who's been through it knows, by the time you're diagnosed, I mean the family knows. You've you known know, for a long time. You know, for well, we knew for a year, and we kept, you know, not take, take him back every week or anything. <laughs> Poor guy. But you know, we kept sort of saying, it's just not. Michael was the only one who didn't realize, interestingly enough, which was a bl real blessing. So he yeah. wasn't anxious about it or anything. He was just, no, I'm fine, and you know, I think we're fine. So, but you know, the interesting thing is he was the head of hematology at the Montreal Children. So he's a, a really, really intelligent person. And the tests are really for sort of normal people, more people like me. So he went, he went from extremely intelligent to normal. So he tested just fine. <laughs> if I get dementia, it will be immediately obvious. I'll <laughs> I'm clinging to normal anyway. <laughs> so, so now you can speak to him on your own level. That's it's right. Now, <laughs> <relationship>. Yes, finally. <laughs> and he's, he's, um, he's, a, he's the happiest man I know. And, and yes, it, Gamash was inspired by him because, yeah. you know, he had this terrible job. And it was a job he chose. 
and he was very, very good at it. He was the head of it, and he, he, he was the first, he holds the first name chair in Canada in pediatric hematology. But he, you know, it's just a terrible job. It was children with cancer. And he, you know, he would sit with them through the night, and he'd have to talk to and tell young parents things no parent should ever have to hear. And he used to wear these bow ties with, with, with um, like Winnie the Pooh and uh, Mickey Mouse so that when he leaned over the kids, that's what they would see. They wouldn't see the, the scary doctor, they would see the, the balloons or They'd the giggle. duck. That's right. Mm. But he would come home every night, the happiest man in the world. Not because dying children gave him pleasure. It was because he understood what a gift life is. And you know, if those of us who get to live it, and those children don't, how awful mm -hmm. if we don't live it with a, an awareness of gratitude, with joy, in the light, with fullness of heart, and completely experiencing it, because these kids don't get to live it. And Michael understood that, and so he, he fills every moment with joy. And now, even in dementia, he's the happiest man I know. And I know, you know, dementia takes many, many forms, and we've been very lucky, and not everyone you know, some people get very anxious, and, and some people get violent, and, and some people just, you know, get happy. And I, I would venture that in this room there are people who have it in the family. Oh, I would, I would think. Almost all of us have had some experience of yeah. it. So it's, have you? It's, Is it in your family at all? Not in my, well, except for me. <laughs> exactly. I was no. going to. <laughs> um, no, but, uh, but friends. Have. It yeah. used to be parents of friends, and now it's Now it's friends, friends, I know. So. <laughs> yeah. And that's yeah. why, I mean, this is why we've, with Michael's permission, you know, he and I talked about it, and we said, you yeah. know, we can't, there's so much shame that can be attached to it, like cancer yes. well, many years ago, or AIDS, you know, it's just shoved under, and it, it became somehow shameful. How, can, how could this be? Yeah. Or, you know, the mad uncle in the attic. And then yeah. said, he said, no, I want to step forward and say it, it's, it's happening to me. It can happen to anyone. And there's tragedy in it. And there's joy in it. And there's, there has been massive amounts of joy in it and, and sadness. So and happy anniversary then. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> now, when you finish the tour, what will, where will you... What comes next? Would you go back to, to writing yes, again? Yes, yes. I was hoping to finish it, the first is it, draft. Because you've actually been on tour already for about a A little month. mini tour, little mini for, tour. The, for the paperback of How the Light Gets In. Oh, OK. Yeah, but, That's what, but not, for, not for this book. This is the, the this beginning, is the of, beginning this of this book. It's so exciting. I can't tell you. It's just, I, was, I was saying to someone that it's, it feels a little bit like being shot out of a cannon. You know, it's just, just waiting for so long and then come. Boom, and it just changes everything, and just so exciting. And just, you know, hope that you don't end up with a pile of elephant dung at but, the other end. <laughs> you, you worked on this the same way, well, maybe not for 45 years, but draft after yeah. draft after draft. Before, that's how it's, that's how before it's done. Before you get, get it out. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's, so. And there's, it's finding that balance of, and you know what this is like, of, of discipline and of work and of structure and of will, willing it to come alive, but not strangling it, allowing mm. for inspiration. So it's, it's finding that, allowing it to breathe, but at the same time guiding it. And I, you know, it's imperfect. I, I stumble and I fall, I get it right, I get it wrong, how, I get fearful. How do you keep everything straight when you have people that are with you so many years through so many books. I mean, you, you want to, their characters are established, mm -hmm. so you're, you're always true to them, but how do you avoid, and I don't recall that you ever have, repeating yourself, having somebody come out with a thought that they've had yes. before. I guess, did I computers that, make it possible to check for that sort no, of thing? Or? not mine. <laughs> how do you sort it all out? Do you work on a big board and everything? No, no, I don't. I just, I, I carry around notebooks. Each book has a notebook. Yeah. Um, and I make notes. I start making notes about six months before I start writing. And, uh, and, and a lot of it comes in the, in the editing process of shaping, of simplifying, of taking things out. Again, as I said with the first draft, I give myself permission to, 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 some of the times in the first draft, I'll have the same scene repeated a few times, because I'm not really sure where in the book it actually belongs. Where is it best? Well, I thought it was best here, but then later on I think, you know what, it's actually better here. Yeah. And then, then somewhere in the process, 
it becomes clear, oh, it's better here. I mean, characters change sex, they change names, it's, <laughs> it's, it's almost interesting. And then there's Bean, whom we don't know. Bean, yes. the androgynous character, <laughs> who comes back in this book, actually. <laughs> well, if it doesn't work out, you can always come back to radio. <laughs> <laughs> I was famous for the, unlike Mary Lou, who was famous for As It Happens, I was famous for the one o'clock time signal. <laughs> no, you, I was. That is not true. You, you know it's not true. Him, I could still say it. Do you, do you still do it? Do you act, did you I actually can. record it? No, no, no. I would do it live every day at the sound of the long dash. Oh, you're not kidding. Following 10 Hold seconds. On. Are you ready? Him. No, do that again. The fall, at the sound of the long dash, following 10 seconds of silence, it will be exactly 1 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. <laughs> <laughs> Did you know that for years, for years, they had the script wrong for that? No. Can you believe what did they that? Say? No, what did they, they say? They used to say at the, say it again, how does it start? Um, at, the, at the sound of the long dash. At the sound of the long dash, followed by 10 seconds of silence. Oh, but it no. wasn't followed by, no, it, was it was following. <laughs> oh my God. And every time they did it, I thought, somebody really has to correct yeah. them. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, but you're, you were on your coffee break. I'm not, somebody else should really. <laughs> now, we do have, if you would allow, I know you will. Mm -hmm. uh, I know there will be people in the audience who would like to ask you questions oh, yes. of their We'd own. But doesn't Mary Lou done an amazing job? I'm not fantastic? saying goodbye yet. <laughs> no, I know, you're still here, but I want to make sure. I'm, I'm not allowed to hog the whole time uh, with you, but I, I will invite you um, when you're ready, there's a lady here, too. There are microphones um, there. <laughs> and there are people, I think, who will go around the room with a mic. And the only thing I would ask, sorry, just before you start, is um, it, because the books really are so intertwined, to try not to give oh, away, oh, no, no, you know, no. why was so-and-so the murderer is oh, probably not no, the way to start. No, no, no. I, I, th I, think, I think you're going to like what I have to say, actually. Um, it really goes to the names of your characters, but I have to tell you a little story first. Uh, I'm originally from Montreal, which I love passionately, and uh, when a good friend of mine was taking her daughter to visit the grandparents in Ottawa, I get to stay in her apartment on the corner of Outremont and Bernard, mm. a neighborhood you know. And uh, her mother in Ottawa is my very close and dearest friend. So I'm down on St. Catherine Street in Chapters, and there's this loud banging music, and I can't wait to get out of there, and I'm very, very, very upset. And I'm at the door, and there's a long line of books, Still Life by Louise Penny. Because I'm so agitated, I misread the name, and I go, Louise Penny wrote a book. I pick it up, look at the first few pages, and, oh, that doesn't look like Louise Pelley, someone I went to law school with. And then the second page, <laughs> se the second page, there's the word Clara Morrow. So, this is the story. Now, the coincidence is, come real, the coincidence really comes at the end. The apartment I'm staying at, Jennifer Morrow is taking her daughter, Clara Morrow, to visit her grandparents, <laughs> Sally and Charles Morrow, in Ottawa. Oh. Not the coincidence. Uh, you bought amazing, the book, I hope. Amazing. The coincidence is, is after I buy the book, I've read all of your books, by the way, I, I buy the book, I race back to the apartment, I call Ottawa, Charles answers, I said, Chuck, you're never going to believe this, I got this book, Still Life, and the main character, he says, is Clara Morrow. I said, how do you know? Well, it turned out that my best friend and myself, in two different cities, Montreal, Ottawa, at the same time, picked up that book. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, my, meant to be? That's wonderful. I, I, I thought, was, but the name Clara Morrow, I wonder uh, where you got it from afterwards. What's in the name? The, where did it come from? Where did it come the from? Name. Thank I, you. I actually, I, I, I think a lot about my characters' names. Yeah. Um, I wanted the, main, the characters in the village to have regular names, even, even almost banal names. Peter, um, you know, Ruth, yes. some of the others. Um, 
So I, I Clara, because I, because I, I wanted the sense of clarity. Clara, clarity. M Moro was just a, you know, again a common name. So, so that's really where it came from. But I, I walk around a lot, and I think, who, what's your name? What's your name? That's why the character's names sometimes change as the book goes on, because I realize, no, you're not a Pierre, you're a Serge, or whatever. It was just the most amazing coincidence that several of the characters' names appear in yes. my life and on the corner of Bernard and Utremont. Yes, and exactly. What is your name? Thank Perhaps you. you can be in the next book. <laughs> it's Joyce Miller. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. A wonderful Thank you. story. Thank you very much. I love those stories of, of <laughs> synchronicity like that. I've got a really short question, and I'm going to write down your answer. So I'm assuming that Michael wear, wears rose water and sandalwood, and if so, what is the brand? <laughs> <laughs> is there somebody, somebody well, she'd like to introduce? It to? Do you know what it is? is um, uh, he wears sandalwood, and this is actually described in the books later on. I don't know whether which book it's described in. I think it might be how the light gets in that that Gamache's cologne actually doesn't have rose water in it, but Ren but Ren Marie's does. Yeah, and so light. when he kisses her, he gets a little bit of her per perfume on his clothing. And so that's how the two aromas yeah. combine. But when we were in England, in London, we went to one of my favorite perfumers, uh, Floris, which is on German Street, and they, they have a forgotten what the person is called, but some, a chemist who will make up their own sense. Yes. And so I gave her still life, where it's described, and I said, um, can, can you create this scent for us, a cologne for men? Oh, really? Yes. And so we went back six months later, so we're emailing with her, and uh, she had all of these different vials. It's the most amazing thing. It looks like something out of the, the 16th century. Yeah. yeah. And so she let us smell them, and so we chose an eau de gamache. So there is a no, florist. You eau have de your own perfume line now too. <laughs> <laughs> when right. does that come out? <laughs> we'll be seeing you at Holtz. Well, you you can actually buy eau de gamache if you get in touch with florist. Now the the, the downside is okay. it's unbelievably expensive. Ah. <laughs> Even I, I was shocked. I couldn't believe it, but anyway, so. We may end up going somewhere else where it's a little bit less expensive, and yeah. so it's a little bit more um, um, attainable by, sure, by surely people. Surely Michael, Mark? with his connections with doctors and chemists, <laughs> <laughs> right. get something going. Yes, oh, the <laughs> urine. <laughs> Isn't that blood and urine is what you'd get <laughs> from doctors? <laughs> Hi, Louise. I wanted to share this story, and I shared it on uh, your Facebook page. Um, okay. um, I work in a drop-in center uh, for children and families, so parents and caregivers will bring their kids to the drop-in center. And we had uh, an aunt with somebody who comes regularly. She's the aunt of a child and also one of our caregivers. And she just started sharing about her nephew, and I won't, you know, go into too many details, but she was a little concerned because he, he likes, he's a little guy who likes to wear dresses, and the parents and she were allowing him to do this, and she really felt her instincts were right, they felt good about this, but I think she was just wanting some, some reassurance, and I wanted to give her that, and I can remember sort of searching for the words and not knowing what to say or trying to find the right words. And I was delighted to hear you mention Bean, because all of a sudden, Bean came oh. to me. And so, you know, I told her about your books, and I told her about Bean. Mm. And the words that came were one of the words that, something you had shared, and uh, the important question what nobody had asked was, was Bean happy? Mm. And so I remember saying to her, you know, is he happy? And she sort of, her eyes filled with tears, and she said yes. And I said, then I think you're doing the right thing. Oh. And um, yeah, I'm, so you. anyway, so that I just want to thank you for that gift because you know, I mean, that certainly when I read that story and read, you know, what you had written, I never imagined that I would then be able to pass that on and, and share with her. So I just wanted to share that and thank you for it. Oh, I am so touched. Thank you. Oh, can can I kiss hug you? <laughs> can you come up here? I'll give you a hug. 
Oh, what a lovely thing. Thank you. What a kind person you are. Thank you. Hi, Louise. Um, I grew up in a small village in Quebec, south of Montreal, in the Chateauguay Valley. It was called Ormstown. Oh, yes. And it's a very Anglophone uh, region. And so when I read your book, it brought me back to my small village, which is a wonderful thing because it was such a good time in my life. Um, and the Anglophone, Francophone, you know, that you capture in your book is very interesting to me because it speaks to me that that's how it really was. I'm wondering, do you get that from Francophones who read your book? Do they feel that they have a better understanding or that that's how they view the, the relationship? That's a, that's a really interesting question. Um, it is translated. Yes, right? it's they translated into now. French now. Yes. They weren't for the longest time. Right. Um, and of course, many of the Francophones speak, read English as well. Mm. I, you know, I get the sense that at first, I remember watching a, a television show where the, my French editors were saying, oh, they're going to discuss your book. So I turned it on to see what they had to say. Mm. And you know, it was the still life that had just been translated into French. So they were discussing it, and, and one of them was saying, well, of course, you know, this is a completely fictional village because, you know, th this population of English wouldn't exist. <laughs> <laughs> what? Well, it does. <laughs> so it, it, it came as a surprise that there's, you know, still, I think, some, some parts of the population who don't realize that, you know, the Anglos do exist, but for the most part. <laughs> <laughs> Not if but, they can help it. <laughs> <laughs> we all left. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, but I think, I, think, I think for the most part, I think, it is, I think it has helped sort of sensitize. Every now and then I do get sort of angry emails, both from the Fren French side and certainly from the English side, who feel that I've been unfair and I don't understand. Unfair? Yes. Well, that, that you know, that, because I do talk about the, that, you know, one of the reasons the the. French felt that they had to fight to become maitre chez nous is because they weren't. They weren't allowed to, and I think a lot of the Anglophones may forget that. But that was my mother's and my parents' generation. We lived in Quebec at the time, and my mother, who was born and raised in Quebec, didn't speak French. She spoke enough French, she used to say quite proudly, to speak to her cleaning lady. And, and she had no awareness of how appalling that was on every level until she got older and, you know, until she was well into her 70s. And I remember her saying, now I know what an insult that was. Um, but she, she genuinely didn't. And, you know, it's no, no wonder that the Francophones, when that was the, uh, mm -hmm. the view, said no more. Um, you know, but at the same time, you know, the Francophones didn't, don't, some, some in that society don't value the very real contribution of the Anglophones to Quebec society. So there were you know, mistakes made on both sides and some, some bitterness that still exists, obviously, on both sides. Thank you. Hey. Hello. <laughs> Hi. Um, Hi. I have a question. I don't know if you knew this starting out with your books or um, you, know, you have a plan as to where you're going, but your last book very much felt like almost the end of the series, right? I was kind of reading it thinking, oh, it's over, and, you know, that's it. And don't I'll say like, too much. Don't say too much. Yeah. That's it. Okay. That's all I'm going to say. And then, you know, um, you have this, you know, new book, new sort of, I guess, chapter in the life. Did you plan that from the start, or do you have a sense of where you're going, or does that sort of <laughs> organically grow off. through the process? <laughs> I think she's got the measure of me. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, I, I knew all along that I wanted it to continue. Mm. Um, I knew that the storyline with Francoeur and that needed to end. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and I knew when, when I was writing the fifth book, The Brutal Telling, mm. I knew how book nine would end. It was all sort of gearing toward you knew the final scene. That's right. But I also knew that it, there would be uh, ongoing. The, the series would continue, but it would have to change. And you know, one of the things that I had heard about Agatha Christie, for instance, yeah. and Poirot, a beloved character, was that she grew tired of Poirot. And I think 
one of the reasons she may have grown tired of him is because he never changed. Right. He was essentially the same character in 1920 as he was in 1960. Um, and I, th that, I couldn't That's not true write of that. Gamache. No, changes things every, have to change. The they have to be, murder isn't trivialized. There is a, there is a, a price to be paid emotionally, and so they evolve. Um, but it's not clear to me exactly how they're going to evolve, and that's all part of the guiding without throttling um, the characters. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Louise. Hello. I just wanted to tell you, I took the tour in Quebec City. Oh, good. And it was fabulous. Oh, good. Oh, I'm so glad. <laughs> and, and one thing I was concerned when I was reading the book is, how historically true it was. And, and he showed us that you didn't make up this, that you may tweak it, but it was fabulous. Oh, I'm so glad. And it was so much fun to wander the streets of Quebec City with other people who had read the book. Oh. <laughs> I want to thank you. Oh, thank you. So it works. I'm thrilled. I'm thrilled. Isn't that fun? <laughs> yeah. I've been reading all of books, but it just hit me in the last one I read when you talk about uh, Three Pines and, and finding Three Pines. It's not on the maps, anything. And one day it hit me, Brigadoon. Was yes. there anything in your mind about uh, Brigadoon when you invented For sure. Uh, and in fact, I think in one of the earlier books, I, I might even reference Brigadoon, mm -hmm. but you're absolutely bang on with that. Uh, Brigadoon Narnia. You know, it, it's those those references are, are made absolutely. You're you're right on purpose. There there is intentionally something kind of the magical realism, the sense that this is a place found by people who are meant to find it, um, and only ever found by people lost, and and not everybody finds three pines, and, and even some who do don't don't belong. They, they pass through, they pass out the other side. Right or now, Beauvoir. they go straight into the ground. Or they go into the ground, <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> never make it out. That's, that's the thing, it's, it's kind of like Darwinism at its best. <laughs> you know, if they haven't been following the news and they pause for too long in this village. <laughs> yes. Hi, Louise. Hi. I'm from um, Pennsylvania. So I'm one of the Americans that absolutely love your oh, books. Oh, thank you. <laughs> absolutely love thank it. Thank you. Um, and I'm sure all of us here have favorite characters. And mine, uh, other than, of course, Gamache and whatever, is Ruth. I <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but mine is the duck. <laughs> Yours is the duck. <laughs> no, you're I not going to tell me to shut the duck up, are you? <laughs> <laughs> my, my question is... Um, the poetry in your books Ooh. are so beautiful, and I would like for you to please publish a book of Ruth's poetry. <laughs> and could we have some kind of a compilation or, or something? Um, I just love Ruth, so the more you do with her, the better. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, you know where Ruth, maybe you want to take it. Do you know where Ruth's know poetry? Ruth? No, you do know <laughs> the, the model for Ruth. Uh, do you know where <laughs> poetry? <laughs> do you know where her poetry comes from? Uh, no, I don't. It's it's actually at the beginning. No. It's not mine. I wish it was mine. I am the worst poet in the world. I'm some, you know, I write like some angst-ridden teenager who has nothing you to be have, angsty uh, about. You quote Leonard Cohen from time to time. I but, do, yeah. but you know, Ruth's actual poetry is um, mostly Margaret Atwood. Oh, I should know. Yep, from, from and it's, it's at the beginning, there's acknowledgments. It's done with her permission because you don't want to piss off Margaret Atwood. No. <laughs> <laughs> End of career. <laughs> And it's a stunning poetry. It's, yes. it's just, well, I'm such a fan of hers anyway, but never mind this poet. Yes. And it's from a, a book called Morning, a cheerful little volume called Morning in the Burned House. She is a wonderful she poet. She is a wonderful, really oh, wonderful poet. God, okay, so we'll just all go out and buy Margaret's book then. <laughs> <laughs> I, 
I'd just like to encourage a few more men to get up here. I thought I'd give a little <laughs> example. Um, I'm wondering if you could reflect a little bit about human vulnerability in terms of what you've learned writing these books, but also obviously your own personal story and the story you shared tonight about your husband. Mm, mm, thank you for that. Um, yeah, these, these books um, you know, clearly are not about death. The, the, the death is a, a conceit, a, a, a reason to talk about life and the choices we make in life. And, um, and that's what I try to bring without making it too personal. But I think sort of the more in touch I am with my own emotions and the more aware I am of my own emotions, good and bad, and, and, and how much I own my own actions, both good and bad, I think the more I can bring to the characters. I think very little exists in the characters, Ruth and, and even Franker and, and you know, Beauvoir at his worst. Um, I understand that. Peter and the, the jealousy, I understand it because I've, I've felt those things. Um, and so that's, that's what I try to bring to the, uh, to the books. There's a, a line that Ruth quotes in this particular one, The Long Way Home, and it's, it's not a poem, it's from a, a letter that Robert Frost wrote to a friend, and in the letter he's describing his creative process, and, and he says that for him a poem begins as a lump in the throat, and she, Ruth is saying the same thing for her, that's how a poem begins, and, and it resonated with me because that's how the books begin, yeah. as, a, as a lump in my throat, as some, some strong emotion that I need to explore and, and, uh, and get out. So, yeah, it's, you know, it's, you don't get gray hair without having had uh, a lot of joy and a lot of sorrow as well, so. So this brings me back to Michael, and I wonder whether or not what you're going through, the two of you now, how's, has that informed the book? You talked about it being informed by, well, inspired by Conrad and, uh, and Homer. That's yeah, right. The Odyssey. The Odyssey. Um, yes. Yeah. Are you and a fan? and the, the 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 spiritual, the balm and Gilead. Yes. Um, there is a yeah. balm and Gilead to um, uh, to make the wounded whole. There, yes, there is a balm and Gilead to make the wounded whole. There's power enough in heaven to cure a sin sick soul. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yes, it was inspired by a lot of things. I think this is, in many ways, my most personal book because. You know, it's it, it, the journey is both a physical journey, but it, it is mostly an interior journey, mm -hmm. as most of them are. Like the the mm -hmm. Odyssey was about Ulysses discovering himself and discovering home, um, and it is for the characters, and it was for me because I wrote that as we were, you know, trying to navigate what was happening with Michael and. And realizing, you know, sometimes you do take the long way yeah. home, and yeah. and what home means to us, and and the sense of peace inside us, and the ability to accept whatever is happening. Are you a painter as well? No, I'm not. But Michael was a painter. Okay. When, you know, that's he. He. I mean, you could be uh, obviously have done a lot of research, but because OCAD and the, and the artists, uh, a community is so central in this story, I wondered if you paint. No, no, I don't. But it, it, the place I live in, the Eastern Townships, is very, there's lots and lots oh, yeah. of artists. I have lots of artist yeah. friends. And, and Michael really introduced me to the, the sort of the nuances of, of painting. But what I, I write about, if you notice, is I, I almost never write specifically about a painting. What I, I, although a little bit, just enough so that you might be able to see it in your mind's eye. But really what I try to write about are the emotions mm -hmm. that the painting elicits. Emotions I can write about, paintings I, you know, uh, not so much, but so that's what I try to. And emotions Clara can paint. Yes. And Peter can't. That's exactly, the, that's exactly it. That's exactly, the, that's beautifully put, exactly. Well, you put it that way, oh, I'm well, quoting you. <laughs> <laughs> it is beautifully put, yes. Thank you. <laughs> I think another, perhaps one more yes. question, and then uh, I know that there are people who want to ask you to sign the books that they're buying? If I would love to. Okay. Love to. <laughs> Thank you. Good evening. Hello. Uh, I just wanted to share an experience I had very recently. Uh, my mom was born and raised in Sherbrooke, so the Eastern Townships is an area that's very near and dear to my heart. 
And uh, as I do every few years, I like to go and visit. My mom has passed, but I like to go and visit her remaining sister. So this year I said to my husband, let's leave a day early and let's see if we can't go and find three pines. <laughs> <laughs> and we found the closest thing to it. We stayed at the Knowlton Inn and we dined at Le Relais the mm -hmm. restaurant, which is the setting for the bistro. Well, it's, you know, to be well, honest, it's not yes, really, but inspired. it was one but of the it inspired, was in, yes. It was in, wasn't it used for the, uh, the movie? Oh, the movie. Was it moved, used for Still Life? No, oh, no, I guess it wasn't. I misunderstood. No, that was, that was somewhere else. Okay. I've actually forgotten where, but it was, it was sort of one of the inspirations. But sure. I guess where, what I'm getting at is even, and I knew I, it wasn't exactly, yes. but I could feel it, oh. you know, like it was, I walked in, I guess that's what really where I was, what I was trying to say is we walked in and I looked around and I just felt like I was in the middle of one of your novels. Oh, I love hearing and, that. And, and then we went to the bookstore, oh, which Danny I understand has moved because they've become so popular that they're are in a new location and they have that lovely little area that says, welcome Three Pines with the two <laughs> And if anyone has an opportunity to visit, it was just exquisite. Thank so, you for saying that. Th and thank you, Louise. You, it, is, it is an extraordinary place. And people think I have an imagination. I have no imagination. Yes. I am <laughs> simply writing what I right. see every day. And I am the luckiest person on earth. You, you never reveal in, in your, on your book covers exactly where you live. Mm -hmm. is, that, is that deliberate? Mm -hmm. you, I mean, are the Eastern Townships already overrun by people? <laughs> Looking for Louise Penny, <laughs> looking for Three Pines? I think, I, yeah, I think it, it is. I mean, I don't want to sort of say, and this is the address. Um, yeah. And we've taken our name actually off of the mailbox, which, which used to be Did there. Did you have just for some, and... a, a few, but everyone was very nice. You know, yeah. almost no one came and knocked on the door. And, and, but, you know, I think now it would be sort of silly not to. Uh, do that, and, and uh, the, our friends and neighbors are very, and Danny and Lucy, when people ask, Protective. you know. Yeah, but they say, well, we don't really know where she lives, or it's, you know. It's <laughs> a new J.D. Salinger. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Oh, yeah, yeah. I plan to become a recluse. Become a recluse, Pass yes. the word. Yeah. Uh, can I take a picture before I yes. forget? And can get you, the would you mind standing in the, in the center aisle so I can get a picture of you? <laughs> You know, I could barely stand at this I time. Know. <laughs> this is a test. <laughs> okay. All right. Now, do, do you guys have the book yet? Yes. Can you hold it up? Because <laughs> I'm shameless. You know, you know who else is a really ag aggressive publicist is Margaret Atwood. <laughs> <laughs> she oh, believes in selling books. <laughs> oh, okay, wait a minute. My God, what a handsome crowd. Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Blackberry, wouldn't you know it, eh? Okay. All right, smile. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you, Louise. Thank you, Mary Lou.